Chapter 6 is about the main convergence theorems of Markov chains. They are convergence theorems to stationarity, and that's in the first instance a convergence in distribution of xn to a stationary distribution. Let's define what a stationary distribution is. So, recall a distribution in the context of Markov chains is a row vector indexed by the state space i. So a distribution pi on i is what we consider here, and it is called stationary if it has the property, or, or let's say, stationary for a Markov chain if it has the property that if we start the Markov chain according to that distribution then the distribution of every xn in that Markov chain is going to be the same distribution and that is true for all times n greater than or equal to naught this sounds like a pretty strong condition, but it turns out that many Markov chains have such a stationary distribution. So recall distributions on I are row vectors. And in order to get access to distributions, of the random variables xn in our Markov chain, that's marginal distributions of the Markov chain that we've so far been described in terms of conditional distributions given the previous state. So this axis is provided by linear algebra. Um, if we take a Markov chain with transition matrix P, then whatever initial distribution we take for our Markov chain, we can work out what the marginal distribution at time n is. The distribution of xn is going to be this row vector lambda multiplied from the left into the nth power of the transition matrix P. Let's prove this. The proof is following a technique that by now we've used a number of times, um, which is conditioning. Conditioning in this instance um, on the initial value of the chain. So the probability that xn is equal to j is the sum over the probabilities that x0 is equal to i times the probability that xn is equal to j given x0 is equal to i. Right? And this is our n-step transition probability from i to j, pij, upper n. And so what we see here is a sum i in i, lambda i, which is uh, our um, initial probability to start in i, uh, multiplied into pij upper n. And you may recall from the chapman kolmogorov equations that the pij n is just the nth power of p evaluated in its ij's entry. So what we see here is in fact lambda into p to the n evaluated at j um, because that is the definition of what it means to multiply a row vector by a matrix. So that's telling us that we can give an algebraic characterization of what it means to be stationary, because if we apply the proposition to pi to lambda equal to pi, then this is saying that if x naught um, is distributed according to pi, then xn is distributed according to pi p to the n. And in particular, for n equal to 1, this gives us the following corollary.
point is, stationary, if and only if, pi p is equal to pi. And that's an important set of equations. This is, of course, matrix notation, but what it means is that pi j is equal to the sum over all i and i of pi i pi j, right, which we read as um, a sum of starting according to pi i in uh, st uh, starting according to pi in the state i and then making a transition into j. Um, so this, for all j, is a set of equations, therefore, that you can solve in order to identify a stationary distribution. And these equations are equations that, uh, um, particularly the, the one um, that, that, that I circled in red, um, this is um, maybe not the way around that you're used to, but it is an eigenvector equation that identifies pi as a left eigenvector of the transition matrix P. So we can alternatively also say that pi is a left eigenvector of P, and indeed of P to the n, because once you multiply um, further um, powers of P into, in, into this equation, um, everything always simplifies by this uh, reduction rule that pi P is equal to pi. So, um, so this is an eigenvector of all um, the powers of P as well, but importantly, and this is associated with eigenvalue 1. Okay, so, um, so this is the introduction to stationary distributions. Now, stationary distribution is one name for this uh, distribution. Um, and this is because of this property that um, all the distributions, the marginal distributions of Xn are the same. That's what stationarity expresses more generally. Um, the other name that we can now naturally assign um, is invariant distribution. Because an invariant distribution here expresses the fact that it is invariant under multiplication by P, multiplication from the right um, by matrices P, or powers thereof. Right? So, um, so this is more an algebraic um, name, um, whereas stationarity is more about the distributions of the random variables um, as, as a name. There is a third name, and that third name is equilibrium distribution. But in order to um, to get the idea of an equilibrium, um, we really ought to first state our convergence theorem, which, which establish pi as a limiting distribution. Thereby, together with this um, stationarity that um, that a chain has when started w according to that distribution, is giving a sense of equilibrium, something that's not just maintained but also um, kind of attractive um, as as a state of the system, where state of the system is maybe a dangerous word because um, these um, xn distributed according to pi uh, is not saying that the chain is not moving anymore. The chain will in fact um, um, generally be moving in the state space, visiting all the states, um, but it's the marginal distributions um, that, um, that are um, maintained, not the state itself. So we will develop um, the convergence theorems um, throughout this chapter, stating them in the next video, then seeing examples of where they are applied, and finally um, we are going to look at some proofs of the convergence theorems. In this video we will state and discuss the main convergence theorems for Markov chains. Before we do so, let us recall the notions of irreducibility, aperiodicity, and positive recurrence, which will appear as assumptions in the theorems. So, suppose we are given a Markov chain, or its transition matrix P, which has entries Pij, Ij in I, 
In this setting, we say that x, or indeed p, are irreducible if it is possible to get from any one state to any other state. So we can say that um, as saying, for all i and j in the state space, um, there exists an n greater than or equal to naught, such that the n-step transition probability from i to j is positive. This is saying we can get from any one state to any other state. We say x or p is aperiodic. If we can return at both even and odd states, well, that's a little simpler than what's needed. So um, we don't have any restriction on um, when we can return to a state in the sense that the greatest common divisor of all the possible values um, of n greater than or equal to 1 for which the n-step return probability from i to i is positive if that greatest common divisor is equal to 1. We say that x or p is recurrent if we are sure to return to a state. That is, if for all i in i, um, the probability starting from i um, of there exists an n greater than or equal to 1 for which xn is equal to i is equal to 1. Okay, and we can write this alternatively as um, the probability that the first time n greater than or equal to 1, that xn finds itself back in i when starting from i, um, that first time is finite with probability 1. Okay, and finally, um, we say that x or p is positive recurrent if that return time, furthermore, has finite expectation. That is, for all i in i, the expectation starting from i of that time, the first n greater than or equal to 1 for which xn is equal to i, that time has to have finite expectation. And we showed, for the most part, um, that if we are in the setting of irreducibility, then we don't need to check these assumptions for all states, because they are all class properties, and it is actually um, enough to find one state um, for which this property holds. This holds for, um, for all of these, for aperiodicity, recurrence, and for um, positive recurrence. Okay, let us also introduce some notation for this expected return time. Oh, this is notation that we've already used. This is m sub i for state i. Now, in this setting, we can now state the theorems. There are three theorems. The first theorem has two parts. It has as assumption that P is irreducible. And then, as a consequence of that irreducibility, we obtain, on the one hand, that the existence of a stationary distribution pi, which uh, I've recalled here on the left-hand side, as meaning that if we start according to pi, then the chain is in distributed according to pi for all times, or we've got this uh, algebraic relation down here. The existence of such a distribution is something that we haven't looked at, but it is, as this we state here, equivalent um, to the positive recurrence of the chain. So p being positive recurrent is, um, is equivalent to the existence of a stationary distribution. So whenever we state one or the other as an assumption, we can replace it um, by the other um, statement instead. And in the B part, we say, and let's use this 
if there exists a stationary distribution pi, then pi is unique. And is in fact given by pi j equal to 1 divided by mj, where the mj is the um, expected return, return time from, I, from j to j. Okay, that's the first theorem. The second theorem is the main convergence theorem, if you like. Um, this is coming along with the strongest assumptions. So we require here that P is irreducible. P is aperiodic. And there exists a stationary distribution pi. If you have all three of those, then this implies the convergence of the n-step transition probabilities. That is, the transition probability from i to j in n steps converges as n tends to infinity to the stationary probability of the target state. This is about being in j, and uh, we learn that this is um, tending to um, being in j under the stationary distribution. Finally, the third theorem is just assuming irreducibility and what we find is that if we count the number of times that the chain finds itself in a state j, so the number of k from naught to n minus 1 of xk equal to j, divided by n, this quantity converges almost surely as n tends to infinity, and it converges to 1 divided by m sub j, where m sub j is again the expected return time. Now the expected return time is something that uh, we can define also when it is infinite, and uh, by not making the assumption um, that um, by not making the assumption that the um, expected return time is finite, um, we um, allow a zero limit, um, 1 over infinity being interpreted as zero in this theorem. So let us, um, let us just record here where 1 over mj is, equal, is defined to be equal to zero if mj is equal to infinity. But of course the interesting application or most interesting application of this um, um, convergence theorem um, number three is, um, is in the case where that is a finite limit and indeed by um, the um, first theorem um, is giving us another instance of convergence to a stationary probability not for probabilities but for what we can interpret as the proportion of time um, spent in a state. So let us note some of the interpretations um, which I've already started to give while stating the theorems. So here interpretation of the third one is that we see a convergence of long-term proportions. So let's write a long-term proportion of time that x spends in j is, well, approximately equal to 1 over mj. Um, is the sort of finite n interpretation of this almost sure convergence. Um, the second one is saying something about where we find the chain for large n. So um, we can say for large n, xn may not be exactly um, distributed according to the stationary distribution, but let's say um, it is distributed according to pi approximately. And that is to mean that the probability 
that xn is equal to j may not be equal to pi j, but will be approximately to pi j. And um, as a consequence about uh, the stationarity observation that if we start according to the distribution, we will be um, um, in that distribution forever. Um, so that um, in interpretation is what we can uh, what we can give here um, as um, as saying that um, the um, chain x m m greater than or equal to n is approximately a stationary chain. Okay, and finally, um, to interpret the first of these um, in the context of convergence theorems, um, let's just note that um, the key part in the B part of the first uh, um, first of these theorems is that um, the two limits that appear in the two theorems are actually the same. So the limits, and that is um, specifically um, the limit that we have here and the limit that we have here, those are found to be the same. And the relevance of these convergence theorems is um, is is that, um, for example, um, in applications in statistics for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, where you have a problem of simulating from certain distributions, but you have a Markov chain that has the stationary distribution, and indeed the Markov chain Monte Carlo method comes along with methods for constructing um, Markov chains with a given stationary distributions. Um, well, um, if you cannot sample an IID sample, then this is telling you that if you have a Markov chain that satisfies the assumptions of the convergence theorem, then you at least get um, a sample that is not independent, but that has the property that every instance of the chain gives you um, a value that is sampled approximately um, according to the stationary distribution. And that makes it a very powerful and very useful um, set of results um, that can be used in both instances of convergence um, um, either um, by saying that um, that you have um, to only run the chain long enough and it gives you one sample and then you can have an independent chain running that gives you an independent second um, observation um, or you can say let's use all of them um, the ergodic theorem tells us that um, a bit like in the strong law of large numbers if we look at proportions um, of times that we are observing a j and then that will converge um, to what we know is the stationary probability um, of this value. And so that's um, that's where these theorems um, are extremely useful um, in applications. They're also extremely useful in, uh, in, in probability theory itself, um, where they, they find um, um, applications in a variety um, of models where um, it's just a case of, uh, of studying the equilibrium behavior of some system that has been running for a long time. That's often where, where some of the key decisions are being taken, um, although um, the um, the system is moving around. It um, it is kind of a stable um, system, and that makes uh, makes for some calculations that are often a lot more feasible uh, than calculations on exact um, quantities um, as time evolves um, in a in a complicated um, stochastic system. But um, well, th these are still only statements of results, um, and uh, what we will need clearly um, is. Um, examples, and that is indeed what the following video is all about. In this video, we discuss a couple of examples that um, have stationary distributions, and we will also explore what the theorems tell us about those examples. Um, the theorems with their assumptions, which may or may not be satisfied in uh, some instances of these examples. So the first example 
is a simple example just to demonstrate a calculation of a stationary distribution. So here is a Markov chain, um, just three states. So from state 1, you always go into state 2. From state 2, you can go into state 3. From state 3, you can go into state 1. But also, um, you can stay in state 2, or you can stay in state 3. So the probabilities here are just um, probability 1, where there's only one option, and probability 1 half, where there are two options. So this gives us a transition matrix, which we can write explicitly as 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, 0, 1 half. So for that matrix, um, we have a characterization of the stationary distribution in terms of the equations pi p equals pi, or we've also got them written explicitly here as the entries of those row vectors on the left and on the right um, underneath here. So what does that give us for pi to be stationary? Has to satisfy these equations, so we want pi p equal to pi, and um, well, let's just write what these equations are. The first one, um, starting from one, um, we can get to one from three. So, um, so I should be writing pi 3 times a half, because um, that's the order in which the matrix product goes. So this is starting from 3, moving to um, 1 with probability a half. Whereas pi 2 is the probability of starting from 1, and then moving into 2 with probability 1, or starting from 2 and moving into 2, well, staying in 2 with probability 1 half. Um, finally, pi 3 is equal to um, 1 half pi 2 plus 1 half pi 3. I've given you, um, in my verbal explanation, some, an interpretation of what um, this means as the distribution of x1 and this as the distribution of x0. So it's all about about starting somewhere and moving into the target state. Um, that's what the right-hand side captures here. The other way of doing this, of course, is as a matrix product, where you have a row vector multiplied into a matrix, so you will take column by column um, the, um, um, the, the matrix product, um, and, um, and so that gives you another way of, um, of extracting the correct coefficients. But do make sure that you are solving the equations pi p equals pi, rather than p pi equals pi, um, because that will give you um, a different answer, in fact, a constant vector as, as the solution. Now, the other observation to make here is that, of course, you can uh, go into solving these, um, but um, you will find that any one of these is redundant. After all, it's an eigenvector calculation, um, and we need to include a normalization condition, which uh, is required for these pi's to be a probability distribution. So we need to have the sum of the three numbers, pi 1 plus pi 2 plus pi 3, equal to 1. So that, um, effectively, we are solving um, not just the pi p equals pi, um, but also um, the pi 1 plus pi 2 plus pi 3 equals 1. Um, that together um, gives us um, gives us a unique solution. And we obtain, well, let me not do the calculation here. Um, you know your linear algebra. So pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 um, will turn out to be 1 fifth, 2 fifth, 2 fifth. And you may want to interpret this. Um, why is it less likely to be in state 1 under the stationary distribution? 
Well, from one you always move away, from two and three you can stay. And so um, if the chain is generally cycling around, it's always um, holding on a little longer in two and three. And the precise uh, um, calculation demonstrates that it's twice as likely, which you can also interpret by um, noticing that it's a geometric number of, uh, of stays in two before moving on, and that geometric number has an expectation of two, whereas the uh, single stay in one only has an expectation of one. Um, and so that with weights 1 and 2 and 2 is what we see in here. So we have from theorem 1, um, which um, I've recalled here, um, that in this irreducible case, um, the existence of a stationary distribution means it's unique. Well, we knew that, but also that um, this is 1 over the um, expected um, return time. So we have, with this calculation, also a vector of expected return times. If you are starting from 1, or from 2, or from 3, then for each of these, um, you get, just by taking reciprocals, um, the expected return time from 1 back to itself, from 2 back to itself, and from 3 back to it itself, um, as being 5, 5 halves, and five halves, respectively. And again, it's not exactly surprising that this is happening. From one, you will definitely have to make a full cycle, and that will take one step to get away from one, two steps on average to move from two to three, and two steps on average to move from three back to one. So that's the cycle that we need to wait for. Whereas for the other states, you may think you need to make a full cycle, but you don't, because with probability one half, you're actually straight back, and that cuts down the time needed in order to, um, to return to two on average. And so that's our, our application of the, um, of the first, um, theorem. Um, we can also apply, um, the other theorems. Um, by um, the third theorem, um, we learn that um, the long-term proportion that the chain is spending in each of these states is given by these probabilities. So, the, in particular, the long-term proportion of time in state One is by one, which we worked out is one fifth. Okay, and finally, um, we can apply the uh, convergence theorem, theorem two, um, noting that the uh, Markov chain here is irreducible and aperiodic. So the P11n, for instance, will converge as n tends to infinity to one-fifth. Okay, that's our first example. So let's have another one. The final example for today is um, an example that we've seen a lot um, and that brings in the infinite state space. So this is kind of a gambler's ruin situation or one-dimensional random walk situation. Um, but we will again slightly modify um, this, um, this process um, so that it suits um, our calculations or rather makes these calculations particularly um, nice. Um, so, um, so what is this example? In this instance, um, well, in all instances, um, really, we have um, 0, 1, 2, etc. as our state space. Um, but in this instance, um, I want to say, um, again, in variation to what we've had previously, um, that my probability um, from 0 to 1 um, is equal to um, p, and the probability from 0 to 0 is equal to q. Um, and otherwise, um, it's the usual pi, i plus 1 equal to p, and pi, i minus 1 is equal to q for i greater than or equal to 1. 
and notice of course um that um this one here um is um just another instance of that one there um so that um that we actually um extend the p i i plus one equals p to include um starting from zero and that is um why the formulas are a little nicer when we now start writing down our um equations so then um um pi p equal to pi um leads to a recurrence relation um where Essentially, we have pi i equal to pi i minus 1 p um, plus pi i plus 1 q. So um, to get into i, you can start from i minus 1 and move up with probability p, or you can start from i plus 1 and then move down um, with probability q. Um, that, uh, that makes uh, for the most um, um, equations here. But there is one more equation that uh, that we need to consider and that is um is the equation pi naught equal to pi naught q because in this instance um you can stay in zero with that probability q um and then uh, plus pi 1 q um as before um for i equal to zero so if you solve these um Let me not do it. We've uh, we've seen lots of recurrence relations, and I didn't give you much detail on on those. But uh, you know what your general solution is. You can plug it in. You do the normalization. Um, solve these, normalize, and then you find that pi turns out to be geometrically distributed with success parameter one minus q divided by p. Well, when that is meaningful. That is when p is less than q, um, and uh, we know that that was required um, for positive recurrence. And so only in that case um, we stand any chance of finding a stationary distribution, because our theorem 1 tells us so, the existence of a stationary distribution is equivalent to the positive recurrence of the chain. Okay, well this is um, the end of our examples video. Um, in the following video, we are going to look at the proofs of these convergence theorems. Those proofs, while non-examinable, um, are actually um, a further um, way of, of exploring the conditions and why the conditions are really important for these theorems. So I would encourage you all to um, to watch that, uh, that final video of this chapter um, in order to, to gain those insights that are useful um, beyond what's labelled as non-examinable, um, as um, the general understanding of the notions that uh, this is all about, that, uh, and that general understanding is very well examinable. In this video, we will have a look at sketch proofs of the main theorems. I've recalled the main theorems here. When I stated them, I didn't give them names. So let me first add the common names that these theorems are given. So um, the two convergence theorems in 2 and 3 um, are usually known as the convergence theorem and the ergodic theorem. So the convergence theorem is number 2. So let me... Mark that here. And the ergodic theorem is number three. So we will prove the convergence theorem. So recall the assumptions. That's quite crucial here. So we have to assume not only that the Markov chain is irreducible, um, but also that it is aperiodic. And that we have a stationary distribution that we denote by pi. Okay. Let's because it doesn't uh, doesn't make it any harder let's let's assume that we're not starting from i as this um, statement of transition probabilities suggests but let's read this left hand side as the probability of xn equal to j um when starting from well i or indeed any initial distribution so let's suppose lambda is 
any initial distribution. Then what we want to show is that a Markov chain Xn that's our Markov chain starting according to lambda and let's also consider a Markov chain Yn with the same transition matrix this is all about uh, um, the same transition matrix P um, but let's suppose that one is starting according to the stationary distribution we know that stationarity um, means that the distribution at time 1 is the same as the distribution at the beginning and indeed that all distributions um, at time n are the stationary distribution so we have here a Markov chain that not only in its initial distribution but in fact in its distribution at any time n gives us the stationary distribution and that will be useful in order to to establish this convergence to the limit because we will in fact be comparing the distributions of the Markov chain xn um, at some large time n and the distribution of the um, Markov chain yn at some large time n the same large time n so now let's have a picture and the picture is um, is explaining how we can use yn in order to describe xn in the long run. So here is the setting. We have a Markov chain xn, which is starting somewhere, and it's moving in our state space. And we have a Markov chain, so this is Xn. And we have a Markov chain Yn that is also moving in the state space. But there will be a point when the two Markov chains meet. And that's what we are interested in. So this um, this time, let's call it T, of when these Markov chains meet. And to be explicit, let us um, let us further assume that the two Markov chains are evolving independently. So what is a Markov chain? Well, a Markov chain is a process that um, when it gets to a state it doesn't matter how it got there um, it chooses the next state according to the transition matrix the corresponding row in the transition matrix so any update of our markov chain from one time to the next um, is done according to that rule and that's the case with the same transition matrix for xn and for yn so at the time when they meet um, it doesn't matter whether you got there through the green path or through the blue path um, you will always um, um, then um, continue according to sampling from the same row of the transition matrix at this point. So what we can do is we can say we like the marginal distribution of Yn, that's stationary, and we want to understand Xn, that's starting from lambda. And so um, in order to have a bit of both, um, we can define a new Markov chain that is following um, the green Markov chain um, on the initial bit, but is then following um, the blue Markov chain ever after. So this is defining a new Markov chain, Zn, and um, it has the property of starting according to lambda and finishing, well, it's not, not finishing, but um, it will have the um, distribution pi of, uh, of, of the blue chain um, at the end. So let's make some of this a little bit more rigorous. So we fix the time t, which I've already um, placed into the diagram, as the first time n greater than or equal to naught 
that the two Markov chains are equal. And then we define a new Markov chain that we denote by Zn. which is equal to either xn or yn, depending on whether we have reached the time t yet, in which case we are with the green chain xn, or um, if we have reached t, then we are with the blue chain, the stationary chain. So, there are now a few things to do, but the key point is that Zn is a Markov chain and it is starting according to a lambda. Right? That's it's obvious that it's starting according to a lambda because um, x naught is equal to z naught. Um, that it's a Markov chain, I've argued, uh, is just because. The way it updates at every step is uh, doing what it should do, either because that's what the green chain is doing, or that's because the blue chain is doing. So it is our Markov chain um, of the of the type that uh, that we want, and because it is also starting from lambda, um, it has the distribution the same as the xn chain. So it is um, a Markov chain of the kind of type that we want to see um, has its marginal distributions converge to stationarity. So now, how, where do we take it from here? Suppose we know already that the probability that this time t is finite um, is 1. So it will always happen that the two Markov chains meet. then what that gives us is that the probability uh, that we are in the second event is tending to 1, and the probability that we are in the first event is tending to 0. So if the probability that t is greater than n tends to 0, then um, this part of the definition of z is having less and less impact, and indeed the yn, which we know has distribution pi, um, is what the zn ultimately ends up being. And so we can have a little calculation now. Let's compare what we need to compare for our convergence theorem. The marginal distribution of x is on our left-hand side, so probability that xn equals j, and the pi j is on the right-hand side. Now, in the setup that we have, we can think of the xn as zn, because zn is just another Markov chain starting according to um, lambda. And the pi is just uh, what we find everywhere in the y chain. So this is the probability that yn is equal to j. And now, it's not hard to convince yourselves um, that um, if you take the difference between um, two probability mass functions for random variables on the same probability space, um, then um, this is bounded above um, by the probability that these two are not equal. Right? Sort of everything where they are equal kind of cancels, um, and um, so this is, uh, this is what remains. But the probability uh, where they are not equal well, Zn is equal to Yn unless um, we have t greater than n. So this is actually the same as the probability that t is greater than n that we've seen, or rather um, supposed we knew the finiteness of t, um, but um, once we know that, um, we know it converges to zero. And that's what we wanted to show, because that means that on the left-hand side here, um, as n tends to infinity, um, we find that the um, probability of xn equals j approaches pi j. That's our claim. Now, showing that this um, time t is finite 
um, is something that I'm not going to write down anything, but I can give you a verbal discussion of why you would believe that to be true. Although we are used to Markov chains that are single Markov chains, remember the example of the d-dimensional random walk where we were considering d-independent simple random walks in one dimension um, and said, well, that's another Markov chain. Well, let's do the same here. Let's consider a state space, which is not our original state space, but the Cartesian product of that state space with itself. So i times i. And we consider two independent chains running on that state space. Well, that's not too different from what we've been doing. We started with two independent Markov chains, um, according to some initial distributions. But um, that pair, in fact, is in itself a Markov chain, and we can collect some properties for that pair. Right? We know that pi is a stationary distribution in one component, but if you take um, the product distribution, where um, each component is independently distributed according to pi, then that is um, going to be a stationary distribution for the pair, because each marginal is just going to be pi at all times. Um, and so from there, um, you have the existence of a stationary distribution for the pair Markov chain, and the existence of a stationary distribution is equivalent to the positive recurrence. And the positive recurrence is the finiteness of these expected return times. But now it's expected return times of the pair valued chains that are finite. And if we are waiting for the pair valued Markov chain to um, return or to visit in the first place um, a given point, such as um, ii, um, where um, it's kind of on the diagonal, meaning the two coordinates will be the same, well, that sort of uh, um, hitting time uh, now finds itself um, having a finite expectation um, for the pair valued chain. And that is saying that this random variable t, um, which doesn't even care where we meet, um, has to be finite almost surely. Right? So there are a few more um, details to check to, to put all this onto a rigorous footing, um, but fundamentally um, this is how um, this convergence theorem is being proved. Let me finish on, um, on a sort of interpretation of, um, of how you can think um, of, of this argument, which is another um, sort of cute little, little description involving frogs. If you think of one frog on a state space of lily pads, um, well, that's what we've done, um, then you can very well imagine two frogs on lily pads um, hopping independently, um, and there will be a point where they find themselves on the same lily pad, and from that time, they're happy ever after hopping together um, um, as um, um, for, for the rest of time. So that hopping together is um, is the yellow and the blue chain um, being coupled. Um, this coupling method, as this is called, um, certainly finds a quite nice um, setting in this uh, example of frogs. But let me finish here. This is the end of the Markov chains part of the course. We are now moving on into Poisson processes, the final topic.